Hi, welcome to APP to APP virtual lectures. I'm Dr. Alicia Dubijunk, and I'm a nurse practitioner, a headache specialist, and program director for Genesis Headache Clinic in Davenport, Iowa. I'm happy to be presenting to two groups of you today, uh, the app to app.org website for the free lectures that we offer, but also My Catholic Doctors. Uh, thank you for your interest in migraine and uh, learning more about uh, our new generation of migraine medications. These are my faculty disclosures. And these are our objectives. We're gonna identify new pharmacotherapeutic options that have been introduced into the migraine space since 2018. We're also going to review the pharmacology, pharmacokinetics of these new medications, as well as some current guidelines for prescribing them. We'll also describe some resources and strategies to help you improve payer access for these newer migraine medications. I wanna to start today by reviewing some migraine pathophysiology. This is gonna be really important for understanding how some of these newer migraine medications work. So as you may have learned in your, uh, in your initial uh, education, the brain tissue itself actually does not feel pain. It's actually the pain sensitive structures of the meninges, the vasculature and musculature around the head, neck and shoulders that causes the pain associated with migraine. Stimulation of these pain sensitive structures results in a release of what we call inflammatory soup. These are a variety of chemicals, uh, including bradykinin, serotonin, and histamine that create inflammation uh, in the central nervous system. The sensory nerve fibers from the trigeminal vascular system, and specifically the trigeminal ganglion, which you see in the diagram on the right hand side. Um, it's kind of the yellow structure there with the three prongs coming out to the left. That's the trigeminal ganglion. And that's activated by the release of this inflammatory soup. What then happens is there is a release of a variety of neuropeptides through the trigeminal vascular system, including CGRP, which we're going to talk quite a bit about today. And this leads to sensitization of the meningeal pain receptors. I want to just quickly review some of the more traditional medications uh, that we use in migraine treatment, both preventatively and acutely, so that we um, are just all on the same page and know where we have come from. Uh, acute medications prior to the uh, newer classes that we're going to talk about today have included uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, uh, ibuprofen, naproxen, and other relatives, analgesics, most commonly acetaminophen, Triptans, uh, which became uh, which came out onto the market in the 1990s and have really been a standard of care since that time, and then we also have the ergot derivatives or DHE products, which have also been around for quite some time and are migraine specific. On the preventative medication side, uh, when we're talking about the older generics, we generally pull from three general classes of of uh, medication to treat migraine. Certain anticonvulsants uh, with topiramate and valproic acid having the most evidence. Certain antidepressants like tricyclic antidepressants and SNRIs, amitriptyline and venlafaxine having the, more, uh, the most evidence. And certain blood pressure medications. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers can be used. Uh, propranolol and verapamil are quite common. I also listed neurotoxins on this slide on a botulinum toxin A or the branded name of Botox, which most people are used to hearing, is uh, a great preventative treatment for chronic migraine and that we've been using that in migraine since about 2010. So CGRP has been the hot topic in migraine over the past couple of decades. This is relatively new science. As you can see, this is a really busy slide and I don't expect anyone to read all of it, but I just thought it was a good visual of how far we've come. You can see we only discovered the molecule CGRP in 1982. So this is really new science. Um, it took us quite a while to translate our, our discovery and the growing knowledge of CGRP into safe and effective therapies for migraine. But in 2018, we had the first of the anti-CGRP medications come to market. 
And I will say this has completely changed the way we treat migraine and approach migraine patients. Um, it's, it's just been so impactful. And that's going to be a lot of what we're going to talk about today is this CGRP. So what is CGRP? Uh, this is calcitonin gene-related peptide. It's a 37 amino acid peptide. It's found throughout the body and it plays several roles involved with arterial vasodilation, inflammation, as well as pain transmission and sensitization. There are several uh, things that we have found in regards to CGRP that tells us it plays a very important role in migraine. We, can, we have noticed in research that CGRP levels in a patient's bloodstream are increased during a migraine attack. And those increased levels of CGRP normalize with triptan therapy. So if we can get that migraine to go away, those CGRP levels decrease significantly. We also know that if we infuse CGRP into a migraine patient, we will induce their typical attack. Of course, we don't usually want to do that, but it just gives us more information that this is a really big deal in migraine. We have also, as we're going to talk about today, um, we also have now several drugs that inhibit CGRP activity, and we have found that those are very effective for treating migraine. So we know that this is an extremely important uh, peptide uh, in, in development and spread of migraine signal. CGRP has uh, a, a few different targets, a few different ways that it affects migraine. First, it blocks pain transmission um, nerve to nerve from the trigeminal neurons into the second order neurons. It uh, affects blood flow and cerebral blood vessels. So uh, CGRP actually is involved in uh, vessel dilatation. And so if we can block that, we don't get the vessel dilatation, uh, and uh, which contributes to some of the migraine pain and other symptoms. And we're also blocking neurogenic inflammation, which um, is, is caused by release of inflammatory regulators uh, through mast cells. So we can actually affect all of these uh, little pieces, which all in turn results in improvement in migraine. So how do these different medications do this? We actually have uh, a couple of three different mechanisms that we see with CGRP blocking medication. Um, but but uh, we can look at the picture on the right. We see, uh, we'll start with the G pants. So the G pants are the triangle shaped molecules you see. You can see on the right where the pink is uh, with the maroon CGRP receptor sites, you can see the triangle sitting in that receptor site. That's a G-pant. These are CGRP receptor antagonists. So they bind to the receptor site and that prevents the CGRP molecules, which are uh, represented with diamond shapes here on our, on our picture. It keeps them from attaching to the receptor site and thus stops the, uh, the communication of migraine signal. We also have anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies that we're going to talk about today. And there's two basic types. We've got some of these medications uh, that actually attach to the molecule CGRP itself, and that keeps the molecule from attaching to the CGRP receptor site and thus uh, stops the communication of migraine signal. We also have one CGRP uh, receptor antibody that actually attaches to the receptor sites. So the CGRP monoclonal antibodies in our picture here are those three-pronged molecules you see. Um, so you can see um, at the receptor sites down towards the bottom of the diagram, those uh, anti-CGRP receptor antibody molecules are attaching themselves to the receptor site, stopping communication of migraine signaling. So these are how these medications work in the body. I want to start today by talking about the preventative options. We're going to talk about the CGRP monoclonal antibodies first. These are antibodies, as I said, we call them MABs for short, by the way. Um, the MABs either target the CGRP protein or the CGRP receptor, like we said in the previous slide. They're used for preventative treatment of migraine, which means that we are wanting to reduce the frequency and severity of migraine attacks. I really wanted to um, get a good visual here of uh, just a little compare contrast with the four CGRP monoclonal antibodies available on the market right now. 
I want to start with arenumab. This is the first CGRP monoclonal antibody that was uh, brought to the market in 2018. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is uh, a human IgG monoclonal antibody. It's subcutaneous in administration, and you have two dosages to choose from, 70 or 140 milligrams. These are given once monthly. Um, sometimes we, use, we will order them every four weeks, and I'll talk about why that might be in a, in a future slide. This particular uh, CGRP monoclonal antibody. The branded name is Amavig, so that's probably the name that most of you are aware of. This is actually the, the monoclonal antibody that is a receptor blocker. So this is the one that attaches to that CGRP receptor site and prevents uh, communication of migraine signal. Um, just like men, uh, most of the other uh, CGRP monoclonal antibodies, it has about a 28-day half-life. The CMAX uh, is six days. Uh, the next one that's listed is actually the most uh, recently FDA-approved monoclonal antibody called eptinizumab. The uh, branded name is Viepti. This is a humanized molecule, and it is given IV, which is unique to this class of medications. Um, it is an IV infusion. You can give 100 or 300 milligram doses. Uh, it does say 30 milligrams there. That is a typo. Um, it does attach to the CGRP ligand and itself and has a 27 day half-life with a three hour CMAX. So much more readily available. It's hundred um, percent bioavailable in the system once it hits the, hits the bloodstream. That one is dosed every three months instead of monthly. Uh, the molecule is designed not to dissociate from the molecule. So it, it, it lasts longer in the system. Galcanizumab or Mgality being the branded name is the next one listed. This is also humanized subcutaneous injection. This one gives a 240 milligram loading dose and that's followed by 120 milligrams monthly thereafter. Uh, this kind of gets your blood levels up to a higher level um, for that first dose uh, and helps with um, more rapid improvement in in migraine. This also is a ligand blocker. So um, attaching to the ligand CGRP itself, 27 day half-life with a five day CMAX. Preminizumab is the last one we're gonna talk about on this table today. This is a Jovi, also a humanized product, subcutaneous injection. Uh, what's unique about this particular product is that you have a uh, frequency of dosing options. So you can either give 225 milligrams monthly, or the patient can take 675 milligrams, which is three injections on the same day and dose once every three months. And that can be helpful in a variety of situations. This is also uh, a CGRP ligand blocking medication with a 30 day half-life and CMAX of five to seven days. Um, just wanted to kind of go through some uh, important information on all of these products. I just put the pictures up there. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk through some things, didn't want to make it a busy slide. And these are the, the, the packaging um, that uh, most of you are used to seeing. So um, as far as administration, uh, the, eight, the three at-home injectables are, of course, in easy-to-use uh, EpiPen or diabetic insulin pen type devices. Uh, patients usually can use these independently. Um, sometimes if patients have a little dexterity issue, maybe they've got significant arthritis or um, perhaps things like a history of stroke or multiple sclerosis where they've lost some of the hand strength or dexterity, um, they may be a little more difficult to use and, and might require some assistance. Um, but in general, most patients can use these independently. Um, they, the, most, the most common side effects of the at-home monoclonal antibodies is by far injection site reaction. So this is redness, swelling, pain, or itching where you get the shot. Um, these are large molecule proteins and so I think of it as a little bit of a thicker solution. It's not quite the right terminology, but I think that's easier for people to visualize. It's, it's going to be a little uh, thicker, so to speak, than maybe a vaccine or a normal saline. So they do have, can have a larger area of injection site reaction, maybe a welted, raised, red, or itchy area, um, hive-looking area around the injection site. Again, that's the most common side effect. 
Um, we can mitigate these side effects if needed. Um, these are refrigerated products. So uh, taking them out of the refrigerator at least an hour before injection can be, and allowing them to warm up to room air can, uh, can significantly help with injection site reactions and pain associated with the injection. Uh, we can use uh, ice to the area that's going to be injected beforehand to help with pain. If patients do have quite a bit of pain or injection site reaction related to administration of the medications, we're often using things like acetaminophen or diphenhydramine an hour before, and that can be helpful as well. Uh, one of the other strategies that I've found um, uh, specifically with AJOV, uh, because it has the ability to use quarterly dosing, sometimes if I transition patients to quarterly dosing, then they're only dealing with the injection site reaction four times a year instead of 12 times a year, which is sometimes helpful. Um, the AJOV, I will say, um, sometimes has more injection site reaction. It does it involve a little larger amount of fluid into the area. So it's uh, one and a half milliliters as opposed to the other two that deliver one milliliter. Um, sometimes I feel like that makes a difference, sometimes not. Um, the IV version or uh, eptinizumab or Viepti, this of course is not associated with injection site reaction, but does require IV placement. So you're going to have this administered either in an infusion site, whether that's in your office or a separate infusion center, or um, through home uh, infusion with a home infusion nurse. Uh, this is going to be reconstituted by the nurses and it's a 30 minute infusion. I always tell patients plan to be at the infusion center for a couple of hours because they have to get the medicine from the pharmacy. They've got to prep it. They've got to start your IV, all the things. Um, so usually they're there for up to a couple of hours for their infusion, but it's only a 30 minute infusion um, while they're sitting in the chair receiving it. Um, this The most common side effect of that one is actually nasopharyngitis, and that was the only side effect that was found with any frequency. Um, so basically, that's a runny nose. I will tell you, I have never run into a migraine patient who cared much about a runny nose uh, because they all have runny noses because... Um, that's an autonomic symptom that's caused by migraine. Um, so I've, I don't, it, it's never stopped people from getting the, uh, the product in my experience. Any of these uh, products can be associated with hypersensitivity reactions. This can involve um, anaphylaxis, angioedema, shortness of breath, rash, things like that. Um, it can occur days after administration and can be prolonged with the long half-life. Um, if your patient has one of these reactions, initiate appropriate therapy and stop the offending medication. Um, whether or not you would then proceed with one of the relatives is, is totally a clinical decision. And I think it's very specific to what kind of reaction the patient had. Um, I have had patients with anaphylaxis or angioedema from these products. And um, with those severe reactions, I, I often um, avoid going with the relatives. And I try to maybe change classes of medication. I have had a couple of instances where there were less significant um, reactions. Uh, and in the particular patient I'm thinking of, she was allergic to latex. And um, a couple of the products do have small amounts. None of them have large amounts, but small amounts of latex in parts of their injection. injection um, pens. Uh, with that particular patient that had a reaction that we thought was related more to the latex, um, we did end up deciding later down the road to try her on emgality. Their injection, injection pen is actually latex free. And so we brought her into the office, gave her her dose, had her sit. We had her sitting for an hour in our office. We had the um, uh, injectable Benadryl ready to go, or diphenhydramine ready to go, she ended up not having a reaction. So we ended up um, blaming that one on the latex. So just a couple of things to think about, although I think that issue is pretty infrequent. Um, wearing off. So uh, whether you're talking about these newer products or even talking about um, the unabotulinum top or Botox that we've been using for, for several years. Um, these products are all in my clinical experience and the clinical experience of a lot of my peers. They're associated with some wearing off. Um, with the monthly products, we I generally notice if patients 
are going to deal with this, it's usually about a week of wearing off. If they're going to experience it with uh, the eptinizumab every three months or Botox, I generally uh, see patients reporting a couple of weeks of wear off. And this issue does, in my experience, get better as the patients continue with the medications. Um, by the way, if you do talk to anyone from the pharmaceutical companies, they have done studies that show there is no significant wearing off, um, but this is something that I and my peers have noticed clinically. Um, we can deal with that in a couple of different ways. First of all, if you're giving an at-home monoclonal monthly on the same day of the month every month, and they're dealing with significant wear off and having more migraines that week before their dosing, I will often have them start taking them once every four weeks. Um, it doesn't make it's it doesn't make a huge difference in time, but it does give them several days back. And that can make a big difference when you're talking about migraine days. You know, it might be the difference between seven migraine days and four migraine days at the end of the dosing cycle. So that can be quite helpful. Um, I also will do things um, to bridge patients during any wear off if they experience that. We can, uh, I often am doing that with um, uh, as needed G pants. Um, maybe using those daily or every other day during the time that they're wearing off. Um, sometimes less frequently using things like triptans or NSAIDs, um, mostly because those can, if we're using them too often, cause rebound issues. Um, in select cases for the right patient, I may bridge them with some steroid, uh, a little, a little steroid burst in taper. So I can deal with that in a couple of different ways. Um, I want to speak a little bit about evaluating efficacy of these medications because it's quite different than what we're used to with our traditional products. So when we're looking at, when we're thinking about um, use of traditional generic oral migraine medications, we're usually talking about a, a standard two-month trial to see how helpful are these medications going to be. So patients are quite used to that. But with these newer medications, it's really important actually that we give at least a six month trial. So we don't wanna give up on these medications until they've had six doses of a monthly product or two doses of a quarterly product. Um, a lot of the studies uh, of all of base, basically all of the CGRP blocking preventative medications generally show uh, continued improvement and reduction in migraine frequency uh, and associated disability over the first six, sometimes even 12 months of treatment. So basically the longer patients are on these, the better and better they get, which is sometimes opposite of what they've experienced in the past um, with more traditional generic products. Um, I will say I will uh, say that Biepti is slightly different um, in the uh, at-home injections in that, as I said before, it's 100% bioavailable uh, with administration, so it kicks in a bit quicker. Um, I will say it also, um, as I said, does not dissociate well. So it actually attaches to at multiple sites um, and um, doesn't dissociate very readily. So what we find, um, and then kind of, it, there's not been any head-to-head -head studies, but we do see kind of the numbers, the percentage of patients who have 50, 100, uh, 75, or 100% response with these medications. We see those numbers um, higher in, in Viepti, uh, and we think that the, the, the lack of dissociation and the 100% bioavailability is why that happens. I'm saying this because I do want to put it out there that when I have patients who are kind of what I consider or partial responders to the at-home injectable monoclonals. Maybe they get good reduction, but they still have high frequency migraine. Maybe they get really great reduction when they first start, but that reduction or efficacy weans over the months. Um, I, I often feel like those patients are really good um, candidates for Viepti. <clears throat> Um, because of uh, the increased efficacy that I've seen clinically, um, as well as the results of some of the studies, even though they weren't head-to-head -head comparators. I find that if we do that, if we have a partial monoclonal responder at home and we transition them to the IV uh, eptinizumab, they often do much, much better and have more, uh, more decrease, um, a higher amounts of decrease in their migraine frequency, and they uh, tend to sustain that better. 
uh, Viepti does come in two doses. Oh, we already reviewed that. I apologize. But um, I usually will start with the lower dose and then increase um, as indicated based on response. So that brings us to our preventative G pants. So the, the G pants are small molecule CGRP receptor antagonists. Remegipant and H. hojipant are the two options in this category. And they've been FDA approved. Um, they started getting FDA approval in 2021 for migraine prevention. Uh, initially, they were both approved for treatment of episodic migraine, and that's still true for remegipant, or more commonly called NERTEC. Um, but as of April of 2023, atojipant, uh, its branded name being Culipta, does now have indication for prevention of chronic migraine as well. So just wanted to do a little compare and contrast between these two products. They have a lot of qualities that are very similar, but there's a few uh, distinguishing factors here. Remegipant or Nurtec is an orally disintegrating tablet. It has a mint flavor to it. I always counsel my patients with that. I will have a couple of patients here and there that say they can't tolerate mint. So I always um, let them know that. Uh, Atojapant or Culipta is more of a traditional tablet, but it is rapidly disintegrating once it hits the stomach. Remegipant is dosed as 75 milligrams, one tablet every other day for migraine prevention. Culipta or atojapant is, uh, has a variety of, of dosing. We can use 10, 30, or 60 milligram doses, and that's one, dosed once a day. Half-Life and Tmax are very similar, 11, life, 11 hour half-lives, Tmax of one, point, one and a half hours, and they're both excreted uh, hepatically through the CYP3A4 system and excreted in the feces. So this is important to know with drug-to-drug -drug interactions because you don't want to use these with strong uh, CYP3A4 medications. Um, thankfully, these aren't super common, you, uh, often involving antibiotics or antifungals like clarithromycin or ketoconazole, and most of the time people are on short courses of these, um, so hopefully they won't have to uh, stop or reduce their doses for very long. Um, I have noticed some HIV or uh, hepatitis C medications that can be in this category as well. So just using your interaction checkers, pharmacists and staff to identify any interactions that will require a dosage adjustment or avoidance of the product. Side effects are fairly similar with both products, nausea being the most common, um, can see some dyspepsia with remigipant, um, constipation, and perhaps some fatigue with atojapant. Uh, what I have found um, in my use of these medications with patients is that the side effects are usually pretty tolerable. They're generally mild to moderate, and they often are transient, getting, uh, getting better as the patient's systems adjust to the medication. So I, I encourage my patients to utilize their antiemetics and uh, perhaps their over-the-counter stool softeners, um, Miralax type products to deal with these issues. Um, if they don't improve or they're, they're intolerable side effects, of course, we may change the treatment plan. Special populations with these medications. We are not going to use these medications in pregnancy. This also goes for the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, CGRP is actually very important in uterine blood flow during pregnancy, so we want to avoid these medications. Um, we also want to avoid these medications in patients with severe hepatic impairment or severe renal impairment. This is specific to the G-PANTS. Um, the CGRP monoclonal antibodies can be uh, safer options um, for patients with renal or hepatic concerns. Um, they are broken down on the cellular level, um, so they're safer. They don't have any drug-to-drug -drug interactions because of that. Um, with breastfeeding, there is a difference between the two as of right now, um, really because the uh, Rebegipant had a small study that came out in the last year or so that shows minimal excretion into breast milk. Um, <clears throat> so depending on your comfort level, some uh, practitioners are using uh, the remegipant in patients who are breastfeeding. Atojapant does not use uh, or does not have any studies like that. So we generally don't use it. And as I said before, uh, even the study for remegipant was a small study, um, but it gives us a little bit more uh, 
confidence, perhaps in the right situation. So when do we know when to use these products? So I've kind of outlined the different, you know, some of the differences between the products, but um, when we're using these products, when should we be thinking about these? Are, are these just for the worst of the worst? Are we starting them um, when they're low? When do we do this? We're really lucky. We've got a couple of organizations um, where we have uh, expert consensus on this issue. So when you look at the American Headache Society consensus statement, um, we want to consider preventative medication when attacks significantly interfere with patients' daily routines despite their acute treatment. So um, their acute treatment just isn't enough. Um, or maybe they have frequent attacks. They're having frequent enough attacks that they can't use a, an acute migraine treatment for every attack um, when we're using uh, maybe products that are uh, have tendency to uh, cause rebound or medication overuse headaches. Or maybe we have quantity limits, right? Maybe we only get eight, nine, 10, 15 uh, doses per month. So in those instances, we need to consider offering preventative treatment to patients with two to four migraine, at head, uh, migraine attacks per month, depending on their migraine associated disability. Uh, of, of course, um, if they have some migraine disability, which means maybe they have to modify their, their the things they're doing during the day, maybe they have to take more breaks at work, things like that. We want to start thinking about prevention if they have four or more tax attacks per month. If they have severe migraine-associated disability, meaning they are missing work, school, these kinds of things because of their attacks, we have a lower threshold. We may want to consider preventative therapy with only two monthly attacks. We want to think about prevention if there's a contradiction to failure of or overuse of acute medications. Um, there's an asterisk there on overuse because there is a caveat to that that I'm going to review really in some coming slides because there is uh, data available that shows that um, if patients are overusing medications, we want to um, treat that with preventative therapy. We'll talk about that more later. Um, if patients have uh, contraindications or uh, to or adverse events or side effects with acute treatments, we may want to beef up the prevention. And really, if patients prefer to be on prevention, some patients, that's a preference. And um, actually, the National Headache Foundation came out uh, this last year, I believe, with a, with a consensus statement stating that patient preference should be taken into consideration when offering and talking about preventative and acute therapies. Um, we should not be forcing patients to take a medication that they are not comfortable with um, or make them not be on prevention because they don't have enough migraines. Um, and I think that was a really important statement. I was very pleased with that. They also made the statement that insurance companies should not be determining um, what products we used based on step step therapy and, and step failures of generic medications, many of which are not even FDA approved and come with a variety of side effects. That's my soapbox. I'll get off of it now. That's a whole different lecture. Um, the National Headache Foundation or NHF also has recommendations for starting preventative treatment. And they say if patients have four to seven migraine days per month, they should be offered an established generic preventative medication. Um, if they have insufficient benefit, it's not effective enough, or they run into intolerable side effects, we then should move on to uh, more migraine specific FDA approved preventative therapy. For those with chronic migraine, more than eight days of migraine per month or and 15 headache days per month, the, the uh, recommendation is that the clinician choose their most effective FDA-approved preventative therapy for those patients uh, because those are going to be more difficult to treat. So now we're going to talk about some acute migraine treatments. So these are medications that we're going to have patients utilize when they have a migraine attack to stop the attack and reduce the associated uh, pain, uh, other symptoms, and disability. So the newer classes of acute migraine medications are recommended for migraine treatment when uh, there is a contraindication or inadequate response to triptans uh, and or other um, 
more traditional migraine therapies. A majority of, of payers in the migraine space want to see failure with at least two triptans in order to consider the new classes, uh, but contraindications do count. So I, I do want to encourage you, use those contraindications. If your patient has a history of stroke, heart attack, recurrent DVT, uh, per peripheral, peripheral vascular disease, or if they have uncontrolled cardiovascular risk factors like uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hyperlipidemia, these kinds of things, you can use those as reasons that you want to avoid things like triptans or DHE. So uh, please use those contraindications. Uh, so G pants, there's actually two uh, available on the market right now. Um, there is, as you see on that third bullet point, and the picture is the top one um, on the right, there is a third G pant coming out to the market called Zavigipant or Zavspret. Dif a little difficult for me to say uh, to haven't been able to use it enough to practice a lot, but that's a nasal spray formulation of a G pant um, with some uh, rapid onset data, and that will be available this summer uh, for your patients. We're not going to talk about that one uh, too much today. The G pants are recommended for the acute treatment of migraine when triptan uh, is contraindicated or you have an inadequate response, as I said before. These medications are generally very well tolerated. You have low rates of side effects um, that are really generally within a few percentage points of placebo. So, uh, and, and I see that translated into my office. Um, if patients are going to have side effects, it usually is going to involve nausea and or tiredness. Um, those side effects are usually mild if they occur. And really, we I see low rates of side effects. And that's one of the things I hear from my patients regarding these medications is, I can't even tell I took anything except that my migraine is better. You know, they're, they're very used to kind of these other feelings that a lot of the other medications give them. Uh, so that's been a frequent report from patients. Uh, so again, I just want to compare and contrast the two products that are available on the market right now, Remedjapant and Ubrojapant, or Nurtec and Ubrelv. As I said, I, as I said when we were talking about preventative medication, uh, Remedjapant is an orally disintegrating tablet with a mint flavor. It is a 75 milligram dose, and the patient's going to take up to one tablet in 24 hours as needed for acute migraine treatment. There is no repeat dose with this. This medication has an 11 hour half life with an hour and a half Tmax. So it has a longer half life compared to Ubrojapant, which has a five to seven hour half life. So that's um, why we don't have that um, optional second dose. Um, the Ubrelvi or Ubrojapan is a more traditional tablet, but it is rapidly disintegrating when it hits the stomach. You can choose 50 or 100 milligram doses, and you can re have your patient redose, taking a second dose two hours after initial dosing if the migraine attack is not resolved, and it has a maximum daily dosage of 200 milligrams. Um, as I said before, the half-life is five to seven hours, so that's why we can use that second dosage, but it has the, a similar half-life. These Both of these medications are hepatically metabolized through the CYP3A4 system and are excreted in the feces. So uh, same thing that I said about the preventative G-pants is true here um, with those strong CYP3A4 medications. Um, you, uh, all of the information I, much of the information I gave you on special populations also applies here. We're not going to use CGRP blocking medications in pregnancy. Um, we're not going to use, uh, we don't have any data on breastfeeding for Ubrojapant, but there is the, that small study that was done with Remedjapant recently that showed minimal excretion into the breast milk. So, uh, some providers may have more confidence using the medication in that particular population. Um, we're not going to use these, these medications in severe hepatic impairment or severe renal impairment, but more mild to moderate renal and, and hepatic uh, impairment is, is okay for use with these medications. And that brings us to a second class of acute migraine medications. This is actually the only medication we're going to talk about today that is not a CGRP antagonist. Um, it actually um, can um, 
affect, it actually does affect serotonin receptors. That's very similar to uh, triptans, uh, but it, it affects different serotonin receptors. So triptans affect 5-HT1, B, and 1-D receptors. And we know that it's the 5-HT1B receptor that affects uh, vasculature and causes vasoconstriction. So that's why you see vasoconstriction with use of triptans. And we, you don't use those with patients with cardiovascular risk factors. Ditans actually affect the 5-HT1F receptor. These receptors are present in the trigeminal nerves as well as in the central portions of the brain. And they're used by the central nervous system to communicate migraine signal. Lasmitidan, or, or branded name being Rayval, is the only FDA approved medication in this class. So several benefits of this medication. First, it, it does penetrate the, um, we do have these, these receptors in our brain, um, which is very uh, unique to this medication. Most of our other acute migraine treatments actually work in the peripheral nerves of the trigeminal vascular system. Uh, and so there's some limited utility or decreased effectiveness if you're using those types of medications outside of certain treatment windows. We think, um, with this particular medication that because they have receptor sites in the brain that this one may um, penetrate the central nervous system a little more readily. And that can um, perhaps be the reason that we see increased effectiveness and possibly increased side effects with this medication. Um, also, as I said before, with the, the difference in these different serotonin receptors, um, the blockade of the C uh, or the uh, uh, the medications that affect the 5-HT1F receptors are not associated with vasoconstriction. So there are no cardiovascular precautions, and this was studied in patients with cardiovascular risk factors. So that's important. You know, um, we've got a lot of patients in our clinics with cardiovascular comorbidity, um, people with hemiplegic migraines um, or prolonged migraine auras where we might not want to use medications that are causing vasoconstriction. This is, uh, I utilize this a lot for those types of patients. You have a variety of doses you can utilize for this medication, 50, 100, and 200 milligrams. You're limited to one dose per 24 hours. Um, there's actually only 50 and 100 milligram doses available. You, If you are escalating to the 200 milligram dose, you actually use two of the 100 milligram tablets. Um, so if you're using the lower doses, you're going to order eight tablets or eight doses per month. If you're using a 200 milligram dose, you're going to order 16 of the 100 milligram tablets and they'll take two at a time. Um, as I said, this can have more side effects than some of the other medications, usually involving sedation and or dizziness. So the patients do wanna restrict driving or operating heavy machinery for eight hours after they use their dose. Um, this is not as big of a barrier as I think I initially thought when this first came onto the market. I find that this is a helpful medication for a lot of different patients. I use it quite frequently. Some patients don't, it, it, the driving restriction doesn't matter um, and they don't have a lot of side effects. So they may use this first line. Other patients might use it first line if they can um, avoid driving or change their schedule. Maybe they're working from home um, and it doesn't affect their, them um, mentally. They're not sedated or dizzy. Um, those patients might use it first line. Uh, other patients that do get side effects or uh, can't adhere to the driving restriction, I don't avoid it in those patients, but I often utilize it um, as more of a rescue treatment. Um, for example, uh, lasmitidan does not interact with the G pants. So maybe I might have a, a patient using a G pant during the day because it's really, or maybe they're NSAID because it's really well tolerated. Um, but if that doesn't work, um, I can have this medication in their toolbox so that they can utilize it at the end of their day after they're done with work or they're done running their kids around to soccer practice. And they can utilize this medication in an effort to not have another migraine day the next day. It is important to know that this is a Schedule V controlled substance. Um, this is the same category as uh, pergabalin or uh, maybe Vimpat, some of our epilepsy or pain uh, non-narcotic pain medications. 
Um, so there is some uh, abuse potential, basically, when they, they gave it to recreational poly drug users, they liked it more than placebo. Um, so just a couple of limitations of that medication, but I have generally found this um, to be a very important addition to many of my patients' uh, toolbox. So speaking of the toolbox, um, I do want to touch on recommendations on acute migraine treatment strategies. So uh, the first two are very common treatment strategies, uh, especially with uh, primary care or general providers. Uh, the easiest one um, is step care across attacks. This is very common in, um, in primary care areas. The patient will have a uh, product prescribed, or maybe it's a recommendation for an as for an over-the-counter product. Um, they are taught how to use it. They make a follow-up maybe a few weeks or a few months later. They come back and they discuss with their provider what their experience was. Did it cause side effects? Was it effective? Um, this can be helpful for some people. Uh, the downfall, of course, is what if that product cause side effects or what if it didn't work and this the follow-up is six to eight to 12 weeks down the road your patient either has no acute migraine treatment to use um, or they're contacting your pay, your your office and um, you're taking time um, that way trying to come up with a new plan I apologize I have an itchy nose um the uh, the step care within a tax is maybe slightly better. This is maybe having a toolbox of options um, uh, and using one first, escalating the therapy within that single attack if the initial treatment is ineffective. So this might look like someone who starts with their generic over-the-counter Excedrin product. Um, and then maybe they, then if that doesn't do the trick within a couple of hours, maybe then they'll go to their Triptan or their G-Pant. Uh, and maybe then, um, maybe they'll go to that Rave or some other product at the end of their day if they're still suffering. Um, the problem with that, that works for some people, but the problem with that is what we talked about about that treatment window um, earlier in today's uh today's um, presentation. We talk about the treatment window. Really, we're going to respond best to our acute migraine treatments if we are getting those in the system within 30 to 60 minutes of the onset of the attack. That's difficult with step care, right? Because you're messing around with potentially a less effective option during that treatment window when really you might have done better if you if you used your more effective option during that treatment window. So this can cause problems as well. The best recommendation from the American Headache Society and most specialists is actually stratified care, which is the third option you see here. This means you're going to your patient is going to use different options for for first line treatment depending on the characteristics of attack or the care or environmental factors. For example, if a patient is going about their day and their migraine attack develops slowly over a couple of hours, they may be able to catch that attack with a triptan or even a good NSAID um, if that works for them. Um, and so for those attacks, they may choose that option. They may need to choose a different option if they wake up from sleep in a full-blown attack and are nauseous and potentially vomiting. We don't, we've completely missed the treatment window on those attacks. We don't know when those attacks started because the patient was sleeping. So your, um, your oral traditional first-line treatments may not be as effective because of the nausea, vomiting, gastroparesis that's caused by the attack. And we may need a non-oral route and or a product with higher efficacy uh, in that situation. We may try a nasal spray, um, a triptan, a DHE nasal spray, an injectable triptan for those attacks, and that can be more effective. Also, some patients that are more difficult to control may need that rescue treatment that I talked about before when we were talking about lasmitidan. Lasmitidan is not the only treatment we use for that. We can use a variety of things, but some people need kind of that second line of defense or that rescue medication in case their first line doesn't fully work for them. 
Um, and so that's very important to have. So uh, essentially, that's the migraine toolbox that I, you, if you've ever heard me speak before, I talk a lot about that toolbox for acute migraine treatment. So that's our highest recommendation and, and what we definitely recommend if a patient is more difficult to control. I did want to talk briefly here at the end of our program about access to these medications. These are some of my most common questions that I get when I'm talking about these new, this new generation of migraine therapies. This is That's all great. That information is all well and good, but I can't get these approved. So I just want to give you some tips and tricks that I found in my practice to increase the yield of, these, uh, of the coverage of these medications. So first and foremost is your documentation. The provider has a lot of opportunities to increase the chances that medications are going to be covered. First is your diagnosis. Make sure that the diagnosis that you're using is the correct diagnosis for the FDA approved medication. For example, if you're going to order uh, Nurtec or Remegipant for preventative therapy, you have to use an episodic migraine code. You, If you give this to a patient that, that has chronic migraine or that you use a chronic migraine code, that medication will likely be denied because you didn't have the diagnosis correct. Um, the instructions on the prescription, also very important. Again, if we're talking about remigipant and you are ordering one tablet daily for migraine prevention, that's going to get denied because the FDA approved use is one tablet every other day. Um, so you really have to pay attention to how you're writing the prescription as well as your monthly quantity. This is super important, especially when you're talking about acute treatments. So um, many of these treatments are Almost all of these treatments um, have quantity limits, whether that's 9, 10, 15, 16 tablets a month. Um, if your insur patient's insurance plan limits their quantity to eight tablets a month or eight doses a month, you're going to get denials if you order 10, 15, or 16 doses a month. So you, you may want um, to uh, take that into consideration. Definitely need treatment failure information in your documentation. I actually have made um, a, a, um, a chart, kind of a, an Excel type chart that I pull into every visit note with uh, their migraine treatment history, one for acute treatment, one for preventative treatment. What you want to tell, uh, having, or tell the insurance company or having your documentation is what is the name of the medication that they tried and failed? When did they try and fail it? Dates are best. That's um, going to be your best chance. Um, how long they took it or the stop date and why they stopped it. Was it ineffective? And if so, you want to make sure that they had an adequate treatment trial, which is going to be usually a couple of months um, for generics or uh, acute migraine treatments or um six month trial for your monoclonals or your Botox products. Um, so that very that is very specific information. Patients might have some of that information. You may need to get some um, old records to look at that information. You may need to reach out to pharmacies to get some of that information, but that's really, really important. Um, and if you don't have that information that can result in denials from the insurance company. You also want to carefully document any contraindications. Um, a lot of times the insurance companies aren't reading the body of your note. They're going down to your assessment and plan. So I'm very particular about adding uh, contraindications to my assessment and plan. For example, if my patient has a history of myocardial infarction, I will put a history of myocardial infarction code into my assessment and plan and make the statement, tryptans and DHE are contraindicated due to history of myocardial infarction. I lay it out for them, make it super easy. If they have to think about it or figure it out, they're not going to take the time to do that. You have to spoon feed it to them. If the patient has a history of kidney stones, Put in a diagnosis of history of kidney stones and make a statement. Topiramate is contraindicated for migraine prevention due to history of kidney stones. Beta blockers are contraindicated due to history of asthma. Uh, 
tricyclic antidepressants are contraindicated because the patient is on three other uh, antidepressant medications affecting the serotonin syndrome or serotonin system. Um, use those contraindications. They will get you and your patient to the next level and increase your yield for medication approvals. When you look at the prior authorization process, um, it is extremely important to pay attention to details. I know some of you are doing your own prior authorizations. Some of you have your office staff doing prior authorizations. Some of you have PA departments outside of your office that are doing prior authorizations. Whoever is doing these authorizations, it's so, so important to pay attention to the details. The Checking one box incorrectly can make or break your prior authorization and can result in treatment denials. Make sure that you're asking questions. Ask the people that uh, at the prior authorization department for the patient's insurance company. How do I answer this question appropriately? What is this question asking? Um, reach out to your pharmaceutical representatives for branded products. I know traditionally, you know, the, these people have often been seen as the enemy, but the truth is, is that these these people are there to help you, and they are such a great resource for getting through prior authorizations and dealing with denials. So reach out to them. Ask what their experience has been. What are other providers doing? If you're lucky enough to have someone, uh, a specialist in your area, like if you um, practice in my area, for example, uh, I have many of my colleagues um, in my area and in my health system that I have provided my contact information and they can reach out to me. Hey, Alicia, how are you getting this covered? What are, this is the denial reason. How are you getting around that? Use your resources. There are also a few different PA support programs out there. I'm not aware of all of them. My uh, office just tends to use uh, Cover My Meds. These types of programs provide PA support. They're not doing the PA for you, but they they fill in a lot of the information that's you know demographic stuff that's our, we already know, and we're spending a lot of time checking boxes. They do some of those things for us and then send it back just to complete the more detailed information that they don't have. Also, utilization of specialty pharmacies can be immensely helpful. Um, the community pharmacies um, are often too busy to, to learn to do uh, what to do and the steps to take to get these covered. Um, they often don't have the staff to get these covered. Specialty pharmacies are just that. They are experts in using these more specialty products, branded products, using the copay programs and assistance programs. So this can this can be a make a huge difference in your practice. If you're not aware of a specialty pharmacy that has these services, start reaching out to um, some of the specialty pharmacies that you your patients are utilizing, um, or see if any of your uh, pharma 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 reps are aware of any specialty pharmacies that are being utilized for their products that can make all the difference. And the specialty pharmacies are often doing the prior authorizations for you. Um, so in that instance, which is, um, this is how we operate in my office, those specialty pharmacies are actually taking a lot of that load off of your staff, which is really important. So let's say uh, your patient receives a denial or they have a high copay. Um, the, it's a very high tier medication. A few things you want to keep in mind. One, number one and the most important is always find out the reason for denial. Do not just take that piece of paper and say, oh, it was denied and move on. Very, very often I find that the denial was for a very simple and fixable reason. You checked that wrong box and you just have to redo the PA with checking the correct box. Um, maybe uh, the insurance company didn't read your note and said, hey, they haven't failed any trip hands when clearly in your note they had failed the trip hands. Resubmit that information. Um, they may have missed something in your visit note. Um, Perhaps it's a, it's a it's a reason that you don't agree with. For example, I, I had that asterisk on uh, medication overuse, right? So a lot of the insurance companies with the preventative medications are using uh, the fact that the patient is overusing their acute migraine treatments as a reason to deny them uh, coverage for preventative treatment, and and. 
with the current guidelines, that is inappropriate. We actually have multiple studies now that show that the most effective way to treat medication overuse headache is to use the most effective preventative treatment. That's how you treat it. So providing the insurance companies with this updated information and consensus guidelines can help you get through that particular reason for denial. For example, that's not the only one, but um, you know, sometimes we're using combination therapies, right? Maybe we're using Botox with G pants or Botox with monoclonals or monoclonals with G pants preventatively. Um, there are there is some research out there and some consensus statements that support use of what we call dual therapy or combination therapy, and using the, those studies and information um, can help to increase the approval rates for those medications, but you're often having to go through that appeal process and provide that research and provide your rationale for that. Talking about Medicare patients, we often, I, more often than denials with Medicare patients, I often see that I'm getting high copays for those Medicare patients. Um, I would also put maybe patients without insurance in this category um, of patient assistance that I'm talking about. And the first thing I want to talk about in this realm today is a program called Extra Help Through Medicare. This is the best kept secret in the, in the United States government. Um, all of the secrets that we can't seem to keep under wraps, this one they're really good at hiding. Um, it's a program that is not migraine specific. It's available for every patient who has Medicare benefits in the country. If you go to the SSA website and you put into the search queue, extra help, that's going to bring up a link to an application process. It's a financial application. The patient will need to submit financial information. And, um, by the way, if your patient is wealthy, please make sure they apply. It's very important for reasons that we're gonna talk about. Um, so have the patient apply for the program. There's an online application. I believe there's also um, an option for uh, maybe older patients who are not tech savvy to do this over the phone with a, with a live person um, so they can do it that way. Uh, if they are approved, this is a game changer. One, you get a cap on all of your uh, medication copays, and they're very low caps, kind of like a Medicaid patient would have. So, and this is all of their medication across the board. All of their copays go way down and are very affordable. The other thing that it does is it gets rid of the donut hole. These patients will no longer have a donut hole. That's like life changing, right? I have no idea how more people don't know about this program. It's an amazing program. And I can only imagine that the government just doesn't want a lot of people applying for it. Um, but make sure that they are, because those are the benefits of getting approved. If they are denied, and this is why I told you, even if your patient is wealthy, if Bill Gates was my patient, I would have him apply for this. Because if they are denied, they bring that denial letter. That is super important. They have to bring you the denial letter. And that opens up opportunity for assistance with cost of medication through the through the pharmaceutical companies. There's a couple of uh, companies that do a really good job with this. So they'll, again, fill out a financial application, submit that with the um, extra help through Medicare denial. And that will usually, almost always, I don't like using the word always because that's a strong word, but almost always result in your patient then getting free products sent to them through the pharmaceutical company. And the, the income limits for this are way higher than they are for M Medicaid or even the extra help through Medicare uh, program. So um, I really have good luck getting things approved for patients. It can take a little bit of time. Um, it, you do need to know kind of how to play the game and work the system, honestly. Um, but uh, that does translate in uh, better access to, to products for my patients and better outcomes in regards to both their preventative and acute migraine treatments. I just wanted to put a few references up there. Um, I will say uh, I I did use for some of the pharmacokinetic data. Um, I 
I did use um, Hippocrates for the various medications. And as I mentioned, as I was lecturing, I did use the websites from the uh, American Headache Society and National Headache Foundation uh, for a lot of the guideline information. So that is the conclusion of my program. I thank you for being interested in migraine and invested in learning more about how to improve the outcomes for your migraine patients. Um, the headache resources page on our website, app to app.org, has a plethora of other resources for headache that I encourage you to go look at if you are if you are interested. Uh, and I Hope you enjoyed our presentation through APP to APP virtual lectures and my Catholic doctors. And I hope you uh, and I hope you join us again next time.